Welcome to The Brian Buffini Show, where we explore the mindsets, motivation, and methodologies of success. Here's your coach, Brian Buffini. Well, the top of the morning to you and welcome to the Brian Buffini Show. I am very, very excited about today's show. More than you guys would realize. You know, we've had all kinds of famous people and business leaders and celebrities and sports stars on this show. Uh, but the gentleman I have on here today was genuinely somebody I met in 1986 and was absolutely awestruck by this person's ability, drive, uh, he is the, the best of, he's, of anyone who's ever done this. Now, I don't want to make him embarrassed, but for some of you, the name Karch Karai is a household name. For some, maybe you don't know volleyball very well. Uh, but Karch Karai, in my opinion, is the Michael Jordan of his sport. And when you meet somebody, whether it be a Tiger Woods or a Jack Nicklaus, uh, somebody who's been the best of the very best, it brings a unique perspective. And sometimes, like I've had conversations with many uh, people at the top of their world, uh, they don't really know why. Now, Karch is a cerebral guy who not only knows why, but he's able to convey and communicate that today. He uh, was uh, the captain of the team that won the uh, Olympic gold medal in 88, uh, 84, uh, then switched to beach volleyball, won a gold medal there, and then became the winningest outdoor beach volleyball player of all time. Currently, he uh, then translated his skills and now is the, uh, the the leader and the coach of the U.S. women's national team trying to win uh, a gold medal in the next Olympics, won a bronze in 2016. And uh, when I came to San Diego in 1986, I had my motorcycle accident. I was stuck in a hospital bed. And the two things at the time in San Diego that were the biggest things in the world was Top Gun the movie and the men's Olympic volleyball team. And uh, so it is a great honor today for me, uh, a guy I've looked up to for 35 years uh, to have him on the show today. Karch Karai, thanks for joining me today. Appreciate you being with me. Thank you so much. It's an honor to join and you bring back uh, great memories back in somewhat of the stone age days of volleyball. That's decades ago, but uh, Top Gun, very clear. The blue <laughs> jeans and the white t-shirts got a yep. lot. Blue jeans, a white t-shirt. It was Karch Karai, Red Sand, Steve Timmons, Craig Buck, all the guys, you guys were just uh, a bunch of hot shots, and uh, you were the leader of the pack. You know, I fell for a girl named Beverly Robinson who happened to be on the Olympic women's volleyball team. I, uh, I tell her all the time she couldn't have qualified for the Irish team because her blood alcohol level was too low. We wouldn't have <laughs> taken her. And I would go down to the federal building, not these fancy gyms you're in today, but the federal building down in San Diego, and there were two side-by-side -side courts. And there was the women's team and the men's team. And I would watch. I was going there to pursue the girl. I got very interested in volleyball. I'm still a volleyball dad. All of my kids have played volleyball. Uh, three of them in college have played volleyball. But I went along, and I would, could never stop noticing the men's team. And you guys practiced in a way that I've never seen any. And I won national championships in soccer. I, I've been around comp competitiveness. But I never saw anything like the white-hot competitiveness uh, that went on with the men's practices. And your guys' practices were sometimes seemed more intense than a lot of the games you played. And the, the center of that universe, the, the center of the lava flow was Karch Karai. And uh, I, I've never witnessed in person somebody who had that level of fire and drive. Here's my question. I, I've, I used to watch your parents in the, in the stands, and they were pretty fiery as well. Uh, where did the drive come from? What was it like growing up in the Karai? household? I think a lot of it comes from my father. Uh, both my parents uh, gave me qualities the other could not give and were amazing uh, in terms of their support for me and for my two younger sisters. But my father grew up in Hungary in right. 1956. Yep. He uh, and the rest of his countrymen um, were really excited. For a couple of weeks, they thought they were going to get their freedom from the Soviet Union and get to get have their country back and have their own elections. 
Uh, so they had a lot of peaceful demonstrations and things like that. And then eventually the Soviets sent in their army and the tanks to crush that revolution. And so he had to run for his life. He knew if he had stayed around, he would have gotten captured, tortured and executed. And so mm-hmm. he made his way to this country, made a new life for himself at 21 years old. He had played on the junior national team in Hungary, the volleyball team. So he was a big player of volleyball and, of course, world football. We know it as soccer, but everybody else in the world, uh, it's a, a essentially a religion. So he, he <laughs> exposed me to those two sports, played those growing up. Um, And he was my first partner. We began playing together in beach volleyball tournaments when I was uh, 11 years old. And uh, he did all the talking. People still laugh at East Beach in Santa Barbara where he used to play. And they'd say, you know, you would hear him before you saw him. The the decibel level was uh, you, you couldn't get around it. He'd be imploring his partner on to do better, to go after the ball. And so... A lot of that uh, that that hit me. You know, you also made me think, uh, as you mentioned, the federal building, uh, which would be unrecognizable today. But no, it was not a fancy place. But you think about books like The Talent Code, uh, mm-hmm. which talks about, uh, again, tracks. Where do you find how do you find excellence? And really, there are three parts to that. Um, you need ignition. And I got a lot of it from my dad and and the other players you mentioned, Steve Timmons, Craig Buck, and all those guys. We were just so hungry to be great. We didn't necessarily, we had lots of uh, potential, but we had so much learning to do. Secondly, uh, we needed great coaching. Mm -hmm. And, but the, you know, we had, so we had the ignition, the coaching, and you attended some of those. We needed a lot of mindful or pur- purposeful or deliberate practice. Mm. Did we need fancy facilities? We absolutely did not. I remember early on, the coaches gave us a mandatory project to paint our logo at each end of the building. I don't think it still exists there. We had no idea what we were doing. We had a like a, a slide projector and projected an image onto the, the wall, but we made it a little less... Um, a basic, but yeah. when you study greatness around the world in many areas, it's not about the facilities. It's not about the technology. It's right. about great coaching, uh, athletes who are passionate and have their passion ig- uh, ignited, and about really intense uh, mindful practice. Mm, mm, that's beautiful stuff. And we're big fans of Daniel Coyle here. We've had Daniel on many times, and uh, yeah, some he does great, great work. Here. Yeah, he does. You know, I, you know, I, I look at it myself as an immigrant myself coming here, a burn with white hot fire. I, I used to see your dad in the stands. Did you feel a responsibility to kind of was he vicariously living through you? Did you feel a responsibility to kind of carry the flag, uh, knowing where he came from, knowing that you had better opportunities growing up in Santa Barbara? I mean, did you feel like, hey, I, I got to carry the flag for my dad? Uh, I don't think I did. I, it would be easier for an outsider to feel that, but mm-hmm. more just he, uh, as you mentioned, you saw him in the, for those who watched the 88 Olympics. Um, people saw him in the stands with an American flag yeah. and waving it so much that my mom is yeah. having to duck out of the way. It got dangerous to sit yeah. near him, but he was just so proud to have yeah. moved to a new country yeah. Uh, and then have this new country, have his son be on the team that is playing the team that he has a white hot hatred for mm-hmm. the Soviet Union. Yeah. And the guys on that team, the Russians were a nice bunch of guys, right. but they represented something that to my dad was right. uh, total oppression right. and tyranny. And so he was incredibly proud to see his new country and the team on which his son participated uh, win a gold medal against his former oppressors. Um, we didn't look, at, we players didn't look at it that way so much. He did, but we just had a great respect for those group of Russians. That that Soviet Union team had been the best team in the world for about right. seven years until we came along. They were the standard. They were what we were shooting for, and they provided us a lot of motivation, but we had great respect for them, them for us. We always competed hard, but it never got nasty. And so we loved the fact that uh, unlike four years before in Los Angeles, 
where there was a boycott. Many people forget, but that weakened the tournament significantly, especially without the Soviet Union there. And so we were so ecstatic. The four of us who stayed on the team to play another Olympic cycle, Steve Timmons, Craig Buck, Dave Saunders, and I, we finally got our chance, and that is to play against the other great team in the world for a gold medal in Seoul, Korea. I remember that because it was a big commotion in my house, let me tell you. <laughs> and, and, you know, just as we're talking, just a slight aside, you know, for me, I, it very, it's kind of emotional for me because I hear your dad's story. And I, we had a chance to interview another very successful Hungarian that grew up in, under the communist regime. And, you know, I, I think at a time like this, when there's so much stuff going on, it is important for everyone to remember, you know, people like myself and especially your dad, uh, know that this is the greatest place in the world. We've been everywhere else. We've seen all these other things. And as much as we have problems and difficulties, there's still an awful lot to be proud of. And as we get ready to go into an Olympic year, I hope this Olympics becomes a great rallying cry for this country. I hope the women's team becomes a rallying cry for the country and helps uh, win that elusive gold medal you've been trying to do for for a long, long time. Well, Let well me- you're right. And um, uh, of course, we're st- striving for something that is incredibly difficult. We have yeah. not accomplished it yet, but you can look at it. People are only swimming in one direction from Cuba, between Cuba and the United States. People yeah. are only traveling and immigrating in one direction. So people, uh, yes, we certainly have big problems that we're working through in this country, but it's clear that the rest of the world making the most difficult choice they could ever make, and that is to leave everything behind, their family, their lives, their friends, their their career, they continue to do it in the millions, and that is to move to the United States for greater freedom, greater opportunity. You're giving me the goosebumps. I, I wrote a book called The Emigrant Edge, which was basically, here's the characteristics of people who came here, like myself, with nothing, and became successful. And the pattern repeats itself over and over again. And I, my dream, just so you know, my dream is that my kids, while living up in a totally different environment than I grew up in, with totally more advantages and everything else, still have that hunger and drive. And I got a daughter, my aunt Beverly right now is out in Florida. Anna's trying to make the World Cup championship and eventually represent the U.S. in horse riding. And uh, so I'll, I'll be like your dad. I'll be waving that American flag and uh, with all the gusto. Now, you are a team. You're very, very comfortable in who you are and what you are. I want to do something you're, you don't normally do, Karch, which is I want to talk about you. And that is because I've been around people who were the very best of what they do, whether it's Bono with you 2 or uh, the Magic Johnsons and so on and so forth. And you, you're on to the next thing, you're on to the Olympics, you're on to the next goal, you just are who you are. But I watched you and I observed you and there is uniqueness to people who end up becoming the very best of what they do. And uh, I just would love to know your insight in, you know, you, I believe a person's born with a certain amount of drive and then you've got to maximize that. I, I've never been able to give people more drive, but I have been able to try to, as a coach, pull that drive out of them. I would like to talk about your journey to become, you, you know, your pursuit, your team wanted to be great, but you were the lead dog and you, you were the youngest guy, you know, brought in on the Olympic team. You were, a, you were a baby when you made the Olympic team. You were, you were great at a very young age. What, what was your mindset for you to become the very best of a sport that's been played for a very long time in the world? I think uh, we already talked about a little. It started with my dad. He had a drive to just compete his very hardest on any single play of volleyball. And I think when you break it down into smaller chunks like that, can I give everything of myself for the next 5, 10, 15 seconds? And the beauty of volleyball, there's this very... Uh, cyclical rhythm to it is we play really hard for one rally and then we get a t- um, seven, 10 second break and we can regroup. And so it's much easier than, let's say, a game of soccer where the ball never stops uh, right. for long, for it could go for uh, several minutes at a time without a break. So uh, I guess that suits me more, but A, to give myself as a player the most I can give on every single play and to try to do things that make 
the people around me, make their job easier. Mm. Uh, that was always, even if I were really hard on them and demanding of them, and I was sometimes a very difficult teammate and demanding mm. in that sense, but uh, my, ultimately my job was to make, uh, part of my job was to elevate the play of those around me to make their job easier. Um, and then also, uh, so, so I think uh, another big part of that was in when I was 15 years old, I was watching the Montreal Olympic Games in 1976. I was really into volleyball. So were my friends at that time uh, going to Santa Barbara High School in California. And I was glued as much as I could be during the summertime to the television to try. I, I, I couldn't wait to see the teams I had only seen in pictures and magazines, the, the great teams like Cuba and the world's best team, the Soviet Union and others. I wanted to see them live on television. Well, I kept waiting and waiting and waiting. And I think I took a bathroom break for 30 seconds and missed all they showed like two plays in the whole two weeks of the Olympics. Wow. And it was at that time that I learned, okay, well, I guess the only way people in this country are going to get to see any Olympic games is if the United States is competing there because the U S women and the U S men had failed, uh, had come up short in competing for those Olympics. So, uh, it it burns something into me that we've got to get better and we are just we will do whatever it takes to pursue greatness. So even once I joined the team, yep, uh, I think we had a lot of amazing parts, great coaching, really good, y young, but very raw talent. So we had a huge, huge amount of work to do. And it was um, ultimately to see how good we could be and to see if we could stand toe to toe with the great teams in the world. And the number one great team was that team, the Soviet Union. We eventually passed them by. Yeah, no, you did. I observed. So I would sit there on a bench and the two courts would be gone. And I watched the women's team. And I remember telling my girlfriend at the time, my wife of 30 years now and six kids later, good Lord. I remember going, you know, the girls team was like kumbaya. It was high fives, you can do it, Pookie, a lot of that stuff. And again, positive affirmation. I'm all about positive reinforcement, so on and so forth. And sometimes I thought you guys were going to come to blows. And I, I remember watching this dynamic, and I remember thinking to myself, this is going to be fascinating to see. I'm, I'm curious. Now, I saw the quality of the ball, and I saw you know, how well you guys were playing. But I remember telling my bride, I go, Bev, you know, you guys, it's all one big high five, and there's many different styles to get there and women and men's team and all that kind of stuff. But this thing you just mentioned about demanding, you know, we live in a world today where we're not even sure we're allowed to demand a lot, but you demanded a lot of your team. Your team demanded a lot of itself, but you were lead dog. I mean, there's no question, you know, uh, who was the lead dog in that, in that pack? That dynamic that we live in today to really achieve, I mean, I think we've so desensitized ourselves from demand. You know, I, 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 again, I've been around the club volleyball scene now in, in the sport for years and years. And it, it's oftentimes we'll see these kids that are, have huge talent, but have never faced any adversity. And as, as adults, we all know that the adversities we've faced in our life is the making of us. And then people seem to go to extraordinary lengths to remove all adversity from their kids' lives. And then when they face adversity, they fold. And we're facing a lot of adversity right now. We're facing adversity with, you know, years of, you know, colleges canceled and tournaments canceled and sports canceled and club seasons are canceled. And I've been encouraging people like, hey, this adversity is the making of them. I, I want you to talk about this concept of demanding because I believe I think I'm going to say it. I'm going to say it. I feel like we've gotten a little soft because we're we're not demanding. And, and there's a right way to do it. I mean, I'm sure there's things you do differently and so on and so forth, but there's a right way to do it. But I think the, the adversity is what builds us. Adversity is what challenges, is what grows us. And if it's done in the right way, in the right context, while building a person up, it's what ultimately excels. And if people want to know how do you get greatness, you didn't fall out of a tree and become the greatest volleyball player in the world. You worked at it, and, and I saw you work at it. I train on it. And then every single point in every single practice looked like the Olympic Games to me. Talk about this whole dynamic of demanding of yourself and of others. Well, I guess a couple of thoughts come to mind. Uh, you, you, I resonate to so much of what you say. Um, number one, 
you are a parent of six. My mm-hmm. wife and I have two boys ourselves. I get it. It This comes from a place of wanting the best for our kids. As mm-hmm. parents, we all understand that. But what a lot of pa- parents don't realize when they push for things like, and this has happened all over the country, but push for things like, I don't know, 12 year, 12 year old AYSO soccer, uh, it's going to hurt our kids' feelings if we keep score. So mm-hmm. we won't keep score, even though every kid inside his or her head knows exactly what the score is and knows exactly who came out on top. But this well-intended but utterly misguided uh, idea of we need to protect our kids from losing and failure at adversity. I know, I understand where it's coming from, but ultimately you're right. It is not preparing them for life because life as we are seeing in the mm-hmm. last nine months plus and, and beyond in the history of our country, um, life is filled with adversity and falling down and losing and failure. And the people who can pick themselves up are the ones who are acclimated to doing it. If you've never had to do it before, that is a really difficult task. Mm-hmm. So that's number one. And even though I'm not going to um, scream at parents who do that, I get it. I understand it's coming from a place, a really good place, but good intentions, you know, the the road to hell can be paved with good intentions too. So we've got to be better for our young people at giving them some, some room to fail. Mm -hmm. Every, every sporting event, uh, and there are far fewer right now in the world than there was a year ago. But let's say we get something closer back to normal and those sporting events get to happen just the way they used to. Every one of those, there are millions around the world in any given day and each of them, 50% of those teams win and 50% of those teams lose. So we are going to be in that 50% where we come up short on the score regularly. It happens all the time in our gym because we have so many good players. Our USA women's team, an amazing group of people, an amazing group of players. We mix and match teams all the time because we want it to be really tough to succeed. And we want them to fail regularly so that if we lose the first set of a match or this or the first two we're acclimated to that. We've been losing every day for the last whatever number of weeks in training. So that's a big one. And then the other one that uh, stands out from what you asked and uh, and posed was this idea. Um, and you as a coach, I as a coach work on and we do it as teammates, as teammates in life or teammates in, in any sport teammates in in, uh, any career, we have to strike a balance between support and challenge. Mm. So on our USA men's team, we probably over overdid it on the challenge a little bit. There were times you're right, we, we, it probably sounded and looked more like it actually did. But it, it would be easy to think, whoa, they're about to come to blows. What the <laughs> hell is going on here? Guys are kicking balls uh, because they're so pissed that they just lost. Kicking it in the ceiling, breaking a light, glass falls everywhere. Like um, We had a guest coach one time come watch around that period you're talking about. And then our coach at that time was Marv Dunphy, one of mm-hmm. the all-time great coaches, great mentor and friend uh, even now. And that guest coach said, Marv, why do you let them do that? Like they are cussing and screaming and kicking the ball. And he said, they, you you don't get it. They're pursuing things that are incredibly difficult. We have them together 50 weeks a year. They, if, if I'm asking for that kind of intensity, I have to give them some release, but it's a constant thing. We have to find that balance of support and challenge. Love it. I'm trying to find the right line. I was probably too much on the side of challenge as a player, and I'm still always working to find that balance as a coach. We're going to switch to coaching here in a second. Uh, I love that answer. Uh, just give the folks a little perspective. You kind of alluded to something there hey they're together 50 weeks a year the the average american there's olympic sports and they show up every four years you know my daughter's goes it leaves the home at six o'clock at night and is home at 11 o'clock at night she's six in the morning 11 o'clock at night seven days a week and she's been doing that since she was 11 years old she's 26 now and she may not make the olympics for another eight years and when she does it'll be maybe a 
two five minute segments to try to win a medal. You know, I, right? So, you know, that makes sense to you. Explain to the folks a little bit uh, before we get into the coaching shift you made. Just give them a little bit of how, what it looked like to, you know, time wise, time commitment wise to be on the Olympic team. Um, volleyball first got indoor volleyball first got added to the Olympic program in 1964 in the Tokyo Olympics. So that makes this year of 2021 going back to Tokyo to the birthplace of indoor volleyball, particularly special for anybody who is involved in the sport. I'm getting goosebumps thinking about right now. Um, in fact, at one point we were going to play at the same venue they used in 1964, but now they have built this brand new, beautiful new stadium that is going to house volleyball this summer starting uh, July 23rd. So um, started in 64, the USA women, the USA men competed in 64 and 68, but then uh, the two teams failed each to, uh, to qualify. Many people don't understand that in team sports, you have to qualify because there are only 12 spots, but there are 206 countries who would like to occupy those 12 spots. So our teams were not good enough to qualify and compete in the Olympics. And then in 1980, the women were good enough. They were very good but uh, and qualified, but could not compete because of the boycott. The men were still not good enough. So three straight Olympic games, we failed to qualify. So finally, the leaders at USA Volleyball, our national governing body, the organization just said, look, we can't go about it the same way we have been. Those other teams are together for months and months each year, for years and years on end. What do we do? We form an all-star team, practice for two weeks, and try to go qualify, or practice for two weeks, and try to go win an Olympic gold medal. That is not cutting it, it's utterly failing. So we have to form a full-time national year-round training center, and that's how we're gonna pick up our game. And that's what we did. First, the US, for the men specifically in 1977, they formed that in Dayton, Ohio. It had some great aspects to it, but it was also very difficult in Dayton, Ohio. So in 1981, they moved that center to San Diego. A bunch of guys then joined the team who were based in Southern California. It led to an influx of talent, but we spent 50 weeks a year uh, for years and years on end, uh, pulling our game up. We got to a point where we were so good that now the system has evolved. At that time, we were not allowed to play. There are many professional leagues all right. around the world that people can compete in. Our USA women right now are competing, some even today, in Japan, in uh, some competed in China, uh, Brazil, Germany, Italy, Turkey. They are all around the world. So they actually spend about half their year with us, right. half the year playing a, a club, a professional club volleyball season. Our program at the time I was on it would not allow players right. to go play overseas professionally because we didn't, we weren't good enough. We needed to spend all year together right. to get to be able to compete against the best teams. Now that the USA women and men have picked up their game, it's back to about a halftime program. But those 50 weeks a year, they were gnarly. Uh, when we practiced, we practiced uh, with reckless abandon. I'll tell you a quick story. Um, in 1985, we, uh, we had won the 1984 Olympics, but the Soviet Union was not there, the other great team in the world, probably still the number one team. We didn't know who was better, but we sure, sure wanted to face them. So we're uh, moving on into the 1985 year, and we are super excited uh, our men's team to get, we qualified for the World Cup. So now we're going to get to play the Soviets in this round robin tournament. We get to finally learn which is the best team, get to measure ourselves up on the world stage. There are three big tournaments, Olympics, World Championships, and then this one, the World Cup. Mm -hmm. But we had an issue brewing uh, because after the Olympic Games, some there was an influx of money. And for the first time, players on our team were able to make more than um, less than minimum wage mm -hmm. to actually be on the team, that they could receive some athlete support. It was legal. It did not destroy our amateur status. But, um, and program. so... Yep. So some of our players or a number of our players who decided to stay on were now able to make 
oh, $35,000 a year instead of $10,000 a year, 40, something like that. So then we faced, okay, near the end of 1985, uh, we had all these young players had, had joined after the Olympic Games, people like Jeff Stork, Bob Stewartlick, and others. And so we veterans who were receiving money at the time first asked USA Volleyball and then demanded to USA Volleyball, hey, these young guys, these are the future of our program. They might not be playing as much right now, but they have to be a part of this pay scale too. Uh, and so we were demanding that every player in the program be able to be be eligible to be a participant in this uh, athlete support, this compensation program. So um, we were uh, failing in our demands. And so about three weeks before we left for the World Cup, uh, we players got together and stood as one and just said, OK, well, if you're not going to play the young players, pay the young players uh, and, you know, start them on a lower level, whatever. But if you're got, if you're not going to pay them a penny, then we are boycotting normal practice. And so <laughs> we, we went to the federal building every day, but we told Marv, Marv was just stuck in the middle of this poor Marv and his coaching staff. But we just said no coaches allowed. We're going to run our own practices. If you had been in the gym, then uh, <laughs> you would have seen what you saw the other times multiplied by a factor of about 50. It was incredibly intense. We were so pissed that we were failing in getting our young players involved in this program. Uh, but we were running our own practices and wow. doing our own thing the best we could. Finally, we get to the airport. We still have not accomplished what we wanted. And so we're at the airport and it's really intense and we're meeting and it's like, all right, this is a really gnarly decision. Do we not step on that flight and maybe cause such plot problems, uh, put USA Volleyball uh, in a horrible position, maybe get banned from the next world championships, mm -hmm. banned from the Olympics, who knows? Uh, d or do we step on that plane having failed in our uh, attempt to involve the young players? Ultimately, we voted on it. And by a slim margin, we decided to step on that plane. Uh, and we went to go on to play in the World Cup. We had not trained together with our coaches for over three weeks, but we still went on to win. Yeah. Uh, we had failed in our mission for our young players, but they understood how hard we had pushed to support them. And luckily, in a year or two, the 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 um, the stipulations of the program changed, and we did involve the young players. I remember watching that World Cup, and you guys were breaking the floor every time you turned around. Now, your indoor career with the U.S. team went went from – from well, start with college. What was your? How long did you play indoor volleyball, year to year? Um, the first time I really started playing indoor volleyball much was at about thirteen or fourteen years old. I went to a volleyball camp uh, that Marv Dunphy put on up in uh, Santa Barbara, actually just outside of Ojai in Santa Barbara. It was it was awesome. But I played in a little bit in ninth grade, and then in Santa Barbara, the high schools at that time were only three years. So I played. Uh, in, at Santa Barbara High School for one of my all-time favorite coaches, Rick Olmsted, and then college at UCLA with the wizard, the other wizard of Westwood, Al Skates, who won 19 NCAA titles over right. a 50-year career. Most people wouldn't know that name like John Wooden, but he was every band. I spent 10 weeks with John Wooden, and he talked about Skates many times. Exactly. And Skates, of course, talked about John, too. Um, uh, at, uh, about Coach Wooden, and then of course got to play for amazing coaches uh, Doug Beal and um, and Mark Dunphy with the USA team. So I played indoors from the age of about thirteen to about thirty one or thirty two, um, including a nine year career with USA. So nine years, and and for anyone to understand the commitment and the taxing and the you know from eating to sleeping to. You know, this is six hours a day, all day, traveling all the time, living out of a suitcase, that whole thing. So you go through that. Then you leave indoor volleyball and then you play outdoor volleyball. You play beach volleyball, which is the same sport and then totally not the same sport. And you become the best at that. You win a gold medal. You win. Uh, you know, I don't know exactly how many tournaments you won. I had it in my show notes here, but it was uh, an incalculable amount of tournaments. And you went on to become 
the best in that sport, which is just extraordinary. And you did that for how many years? How many years did you do the out- outdoor and the AVP? Um, I first started playing with my father in tournaments when I was 11. So I, my, my real start in volleyball was on the beach side. And right. then I got more and more into indoor volleyball. So beach got my, um, got much less of my attention, but I was playing at high levels at 16, 17, 18 years old, and then just had to play beach volleyball part-time for a long time or no time in the three years, basically leading up to the 84 Olympics. Right. After, um, I basically, I, I went back to the game where I got my start in beach volleyball once I retired from the USA team, but it was a familiar game. Mm -hmm. Um, and so it wasn't so difficult. It wasn't like I was picking it up from scratch and you're right. It's uh, the same and it's very different. One of the things I love about it is you're much more your own coach or you and your partner are your own pair of player coaches, much more responsible for everything. How you run training, how you ske- you know scheduling flights. We got to do it all on our own. Nobody takes care of that stuff for it. I love the the autonomy and responsibility that that comes with that. And I also like the challenge it, playing outside under the hot sun. Maybe f- you know five six hours a day. It, there's an incredible challenge in terms of your fitness level and and your endurance and an incredible challenge mentally because there are no substitutes indoors. If a player is struggling, we mm-hmm. have a group of substitutes that we, right. and we can make a change and, and, and bring somebody in on the beach. There is no sub. There's just you and your partner. And if one of you is struggling, you got to figure out in a hurry because otherwise the match will be over. And so there's this pressure, this mental pressure on Uh, each of the two partners and this feeling of, I don't want to let my teammate down and there's no backup. There's no one to save us. I've Mm -hmm. got to figure out how to, how to do it. A a great example of that is um, Carrie Walsh Jennings. Uh, She and Misty are just absolute legends in the world of volleyball and especially beach volleyball. Mm -hmm. Carrie's already competed in five Olympic games. She competed indoors in Sydney in 2000, then which she won three gold medals with Misty in 04, 8, and 12. She gets to uh, Rio in 16, and she's really struggling. Uh, They lose in the semifinals. Less than 24 hours later, they're playing for a bronze medal at uh, something like midnight in Rio. They lose the first set. They're down like 14, 10 in the second. And, And there is nobody there to rescue Carrie. And somehow... She had this thing in her software, this thing somewhere where she figured out a way to turn it around. The pressure was really on her. She was the one who was struggling at that time, as legendary as she is. Uh, And she found a a new set of answers. And it's so inspiring to all of us. But that's the challenge of beach volleyball and the allure of it. But it also is a harsh game because there's nobody to save you. Nowhere to hide. And so uh, you started out right after 88. And then when did you retire? What year did you retire in beach? I played uh, beach volleyball for another almost 20 years. Right. And again, I started playing high level tournaments when I was uh, 15 and played till 2007 when I was 46. Last yeah, which year is of kind team. of ridiculous, by the way, just so you know, I want to point that out. That's kind of nuts and kind of crazy, but you were still phenomenal. I think I saw you the year before you retired, and I was like, can he still be the best at this? That was kind of sick. <laughs> we were super proud. We, uh, My partner, Kevin Wong, and I, I loved playing with him that year, but uh, we um, – um, we were, I think, the third best team on the tour overall for that period of time. Uh, we had some great wins. We made the finals. We didn't actually notch a tournament victory, but we were able to play uh, to beat the best team on the tour at that time who went on to win a gold medal the next year, uh, which is Todd Rogers and Phil Dahlhauser, another right. legendary team. And so right. to be able to compete. Uh, at that high level at 46 and still be, you know, top three team in, on the on the tour was something that I was really proud of. And to win tournaments yeah. in the 70s, 80s, 
90s and 2000s in four different decades is mm. also I admire greatness over time. Um, mm. you know, that's something that you're doing over a long period of time with all of the coaching that you're doing. I, I aspire to be not a flash in the pan, but somebody who does it re- at a really high level for a very long time. Well, and you have, and you've done it better than anyone ever has. And I know you don't like that kind of talk, but I, I can say that uh, gleefully. Uh, I want to finish up as we go through here. Then we have a couple of pop questions we ask every guest. You've done something that almost nobody has in addition to this extraordinary career. Uh, and I've been around some great people. Magic Johnson. He was one of the greatest at ever in his sport. Has gone on to build a phenomenal career in business. But when he tried to switch gears into being co- a coach, it didn't translate. He couldn't tell somebody, I want you to run down the court, look left, look right, and when nobody's looking, pass it behind your back and between your legs for a layup to the guy that's wide open at 100 miles an hour. He wasn't able to translate his brilliance because it was so instinctive. Michael Jordan, same dynamic. Wayne Gretzky, and Gretzky's, again, they, they found other, Jordan found it in ownership. Um, Gretzky found it, again, in his business pursuits. All these greats that I've had a chance to meet and spend time with, You're one of the few people I've seen who's been able to translate. And from what I understand, you didn't think you would coach. From what I understand, you kind of got into it because of your kids. Uh, So talk about how you've made this shift from being the best of all time, carrying that kind of name. And then now here you are as the Olympic coach. How did you make the transition to being a coach? Um, I, for almost all of those 30 years of playing high level volleyball, I really didn't, wasn't thinking about coaching, wasn't aspiring to coach. Uh, it, it happened rather suddenly. You're right. Um, one of our boys played on his high school team and they had a really rough season to just abbreviate the story. They lost every match, 31 matches, but they also lost every set of every match. So they went zero and 93. That's more adversity than we want. We're okay with some adversity. (laughs) There has to be Exactly. (laughs) It's like, uh, could could we just see them go one and 92 instead of zero and 93? Could could we help them get a taste of one tiny bit of taste of success out of about 100? And so my wife said, you got to help them out. And she said, and I said, you're right. And so I asked the school if I could... uh, coach and joined the coaching staff there and took over and um, was just so thrilled for them to when we got to uh, that first match of the next season and they won 21 to 19 after three months of really hard work preparing for that. They went crazy like they had just won the Olympic gold medal. I was with them uh, right there, just so ecstatic for them to after having gone almost two years without a single taste of success. So that was my start. But I also knew uh, just because I've played this game a long time that does not at all make me a good coach. So my approach to it was as soon as I found out I was going to get the chance to coach their high school team, I signed up uh, for my, you know, my friend and mentor, uh, Marv Dunphy had a coaching clinic going on in Pepperdine a few weeks later, and I signed up and, uh, attended. I just thought I'm going to, uh, I'm going to, uh, it's not really true. I'm not a beginner coach, but I am a beginner in many ways as a coach. So I'm going to approach it as if I know nothing about coaching, even though I have been able to play for, amazing some of the greatest coaches ever so i signed up for that clinic and my approach has been yes i have to approach it as a a more from a beginner's mindset uh, uh, try to assume as little as possible in terms of what i know and approach it from a learning mindset and also know as you um as you pointed out The norm in uh, professional sports is that the people who have been most successful as players do not make great coaches. The great coaches are usually the ones who sat on the bench more. They played some. They had to work 
um, twice as hard just to get any opportunities, but as they would study because they weren't on the, the, the field of play as much, they would already develop a coaching mentality. I guess an exception would be a Larry Bird. He came right, right. in and did a really yep. nice job as a yep. coach. I want to give some credit there. There are exceptions, but the norm is – that I'm swimming very much upstream and I have to keep that in mind that I have to work harder, learn better, learn more, uh, rely on mentors like Marv and Doug and others uh, to constantly be striving to get better. So I'm, I went in assuming as little as possible, even though I made the mistake when I, I actually got to be uh, assistant coach on Hugh McCutcheon's staff in 2009, as I joined the women's staff. As I look back on it, I was a quite a lousy coach at that time. I thought I was okay, but now that I know more, I know how how much I still needed to learn. And of course, uh, we're all in this together, the players in our program and the staff and the coaches. We have yet, we are not there yet. We have not won an Olympic gold medal yet. So it's incumbent on me, first and foremost, uh, for, first and foremost, I have not been good enough yet. The coaches who came before, the players who came before, as great as they are, have not been good enough yet. we got a lot more work to do. That's awesome. Well, uh, I think the lessons there is you sought out mentors. You were humble. And here's the, here's the guy at the top of his profession for 30 years and said, I'm going to take this next step. I'm going to get training. I'm going to get input. I'm going to presume I know nothing and I'm going to be open to learn. That is the, that's the step that, you know, the enemy of the best is the good. And there's no doubt, you know, you're Karch Karai, so you could walk in and they're going to hand you a job because of your name and your background. But the truth is to be a great coach, you had to start over. You know, I have a, a brass plate behind me that says Ancaro in Paro, which is I'm still learning from Michelangelo. And, and that's really the deal and to approach it that way. And now here you are and you've taken the team to a bronze medal. But just like I know, you have that burning white hot desire to help that team and help those ladies win a gold medal in 2021 with a combination of support and challenge and some brilliant stuff. Um, I, I want to point out uh, just uh, one last thing here. We have a mutual friend. Uh, she's one of Beverly's best friends named Kim Oden. And she has an organization called the Starlings Club. And volleyball has historically, club volleyball, to really get to college and to really get to play. has to It's an expensive sport. You know, you're typically paying a club 500 bucks a month and there's travel and there's this and that and the other. And uh, my bride was, you know, when Beverly made the team, you know, she's 5'8", African-American. You know, she was all American and there were 64 girls invited to the team, but she was inner city, Alabama, you know, and there was, you know, she was the only black gal and, and she wasn't even invited. And so now volleyball has reached out into the inner city, has reached out to great places where there's, there's great talent, but not the resources. But this Starlings Club does a great job of providing opportunities and scholarships for kids to play club volleyball. And many of these girls are doing a sensational job and coming up through the ranks. So anybody who wants to see us continually win gold medals and continuously see us develop volleyball in this great country of ours, there's some really talented kids that don't have the income and the support to do it. And the Starling Club is uh, one of the ways to do that. So I just wanted to get that in there uh, because one of the things you, you can be the greatest coach in the world. You need some you need some horses to win the race, you know? Yeah, uh, get out there and visit starlings.org. It's a wonderful organization. Kim co-founded it. And so i uh, been a big supporter for many years. It's a part of what we do with our USA women's team to, to give back and to support the Anaheim chapter. But that's not enough. There is way more work to be done, obviously, outside of volleyball and inside of volleyball to create more opportunities for the people who otherwise would not be able to take advantage. One of the things I most love about the Starlings is as soon as you have played with the Starlings, um, they have very young coaches because they are expected to, once they are done playing, to immediately turn around and become a, a, like a an older sister coach. And so they have a lot of coaches who are 20, 21, 22 years old mentoring the next group of starlings. And I love how much they ask immediately. It's, so it's not years and years later that they go back, but mm -hmm. the idea of mentorship and of teaching uh, important life skills within yeah. the context of volleyball is big. Yeah, it's beautiful stuff. Well, as we finish up here today, Everybody we've ever had on this uh, program, we have five rapid fire questions. You don't know what they are. Everybody, we're just going to hit you up. It gives a great little taste and insight into the man we're interviewing. So let me give you these as we finish up here today. 
Number one, what's the single best piece of advice you've ever been given, Karch? Um, approach it as a beginner. Uh, mm. Approach it as a learner. Uh, assume, which an, uh, stated another way, is as few assumptions as possible about myself or anyone around me. That's great. That's great. What one talent or gift do you wish you possessed that you currently don't? Uh, I wish I could play a musical instrument. My dad um, uh, is a huge blues fan. Um, he started the first ever blues society in this country, the Santa Barbara Blues Society. He would play it in the house all the time. I love the great blues harmonica players. I wish I know how to do that. Isn't that funny? And I've had that the first, I, I mean, I would say that's 90% of the answers. When I, when Lou Holtz told me 10 years ago that he wanted to be able to be in a rock and roll band, that's when I knew <laughs> this is the common denominator. What book has been most instrumental to you in your life? What's, what's something that's really influenced you? Um, in recent years, probably a big one has been the book Peak by Anders Ericsson. He's one of the foremost experts uh, in the world, just studying mastery and expertise. Mm. He's the one from which it's probably been a little uh, in a very um, well-intended way. It's been taken too literally, but the concept of the 10,000 hours to, yeah. to mastery uh, is where it's from. So he wrote that book to clarify some things, but ultimately, uh, he's got great concepts in there about pursuing mastery, and he is one of the world's foremost experts on it. And you would be one of the foremost practitioners of it, my friend. So uh, you definitely mastered your craft. Uh, here's a, a one here. I know you're not a big TV watcher, but let's say you're scrolling through the channels and there's this one movie on and you always stop. What's the one movie you've watched over and over many times? Oh, certainly one of my favorites has to be It's a Wonderful Life. Yeah. Um, uh, and not just at Christmas time. The I, uh, uh, No matter what blessings and non-blessings we have in our life, um, it's proven over and been shown over and over again that when we focus on our blessings instead of on the things that we don't have, we're going to be more grateful and we're going to lead happier lives and be better for the people around us. And that was a huge lesson in uh, the th when he got the gift of seeing life on this planet without him and all the good he had brought. Um, he was then desperate to, to stay and be a part of it after considering suicide. Love it. Love it. Beautiful sentiment. Last but not least, what's the what's one thing on your bucket list? One thing on my bucket list, uh, I uh, have not had much chance to travel to certain countries that don't have volleyball <laughs> success. Most of my travel has taken me to volleyball. So right. bucket list, I want to travel to Africa. I want to travel to India and I want to travel to Antarctica. I want to get to these places that um, I just have never seen, but in, but in uh, been fascinated by and would love to learn more about. Well, that is great stuff. Well, we appreciate you taking the time today. Like I said, I came to America and like your dad uh, years uh, before, you know, my first impressions, I, I come to San Diego and it was Top Gun and the USA <laughs> men's volleyball team. And the Top Gun of the Top Gun was Karch Karai. And we've had a chance to interact over the years. But uh, I can honestly say you've been a source of inspiration to me and many others through your example and, and decades long pursuit of greatness and with a great humble spirit, who you are. And you started over as a, as a beginner and as a rookie and recognize your beginner. And now you're well on your way to, to mastering this coaching. Uh, we're hoping for a, a winning uh, season in 2021. I hope the Olympics comes down. I hope you guys are hosting up those gold medals. And uh, if it won't shock me if you do. It won't shock me if you do. So congrats on a phenomenal career. Thanks for taking the time today. And thanks for all your insight. We have um, our finality here today is my coach. She's 91 years of age. She's five foot two and she's won a gold medal. She's got greatness over decades and uh, it's my <laughs> and she's going to leave us with a Irish, little Irish blessing today. Thanks again, Karch. Thank you so much. It's been an honor to, to visit with you. You bet. May the road rise up to meet you. And may the wind always be at your back. May the rain fall soft upon your fields and the sun shine warm upon your face. And until we meet again, may God hold you in the hollow of his hand. 
See you next time.